Now I'd like to share an interview with members of the Flying Focus Video Collective. They're a group that's been producing weekly cable access programs dealing with activism and public policy issues in Portland and elsewhere for 20 years. Two of the founding members joined me in the studio to talk about the history, motivations, and goals of their show. The Flying Focus Video Collective got started in 1991. Uh, what was happening in your lives that led to the genesis of this project, and had either one of you worked in the medium before? I had actually studied film uh, in college, but uh, hadn't really been working on anything, and went to uh, classes at Portland Community Media in late 1990, thinking I was going to start making, I know, little movies or something. And then the Gulf War broke out, what, what we call the massacre in the Middle East. But exactly. it, uh, it broke out in early 1991, and people flocked together. There were protest actions. There was a U, uh, coalition against U.S. military intervention in the Middle East. And PC and I and a couple other people got together and said, you know, this would be a great thing for us to put on TV when we had these protest marches because you're not seeing it in the news. And so uh, t uh, we founded what was then called the Promotion and Production Committee of that coalition and uh, eventually decided to um, start our own organization, which we eventually named Flying Focus. Uh, the war, uh, the massacre in the Middle East came about, and it had been an extension of what I had been uh, aware of since Berkeley and uh, New York and Chicago. Uh, and I thought it needed to be... Um, uh, brought out to people so they could uh, know what was going on. And it's still going on the same way now with uh, exponential uh, uh, gravity. What is the typical makeup of an episode of the Flying Focus video bus? Well, the easiest is to say what uh, CNN and the network affiliates don't have time or interest or uh, ability in terms of their sponsors to cover. Uh, so we typically uh, cover speakers and events uh, that range from uh, local, regional, national, and international. Um, so we will go out to other countries and we'll go out to other neighborhoods and our own neighborhoods and uh, make sure that that is speaking about uh, people who cannot speak for themselves. Our tagline is uh, video is a tool for social change, voicing the voiceless. And we've always tried to find a place on TV for people you don't see anywhere else. Of course, in the intervening years, um, now there's YouTube and there's Internet and there's Free Speech TV has a 24-hour channel. And so the, it is possible to see some of the folks that we have had on our show over the years. But I, I still think having the local angle on it and uh, we videotape people, you know, when they come through Portland. And as PC says, sometimes we go elsewhere. Like I went to the Z Media Institute in Massachusetts two years in a row and videotaped uh, Noam Chomsky and Barbara Ehrenreich and folks out there. and uh, So we try to just try to bring that stuff back and share it with people in Portland. We've done a couple of shows that are specifically about analyzing mainstream media and looking at the way that they do stuff versus how we do stuff. And one of the ones that was most fun was uh, when Critical Mass was around in the mid-90s and the TV station did an interview with one of the guys and they got him to say something like, I just want to push cars off the road like I get pushed off the road all the And time. our videographer was down there and he videotaped the whole interview and you could see that they were asking him all sorts of questions. They waited and waited until he said something controversial. As soon as he said that, they pulled the microphone away. Mm -hmm. So what we did on our show was we said, look, everybody, this is how the news is feeding you information. They're prompting people to say horrible things. Until, and when they get that sound bite, that's when they walk away. Whereas we are trying to present the whole context. Yeah. There, there was another one uh, when there was, uh, in, again, in the early 90s, there was something called the anarchist riot here, which was really not anarchist. And it really wasn't a riot. So we put that in quotes. And we had Derek Foxworth got on TV and he said, which was, I think we could all consider very insightful. And so we stopped, our, we stopped the tape and said, you know, I think he meant inciting, but the word insightful actually means they are full of insight. So, hey, maybe, maybe Derek he was Foxworth right. is, yeah, maybe he's, an, uh, maybe he's really an anarchist and we didn't know it. We made a joke out of that and called a whole one hour long series Insightful Views with I-N-C-I-T-E, Insightful Views. So here we are 20 years later, and it was the last thing in my mind for us to be archivists. But we have all of this material now that is, you know, from Noam Chomsky and Howard Zinn, the Panthers, and uh, many things that have been uh, done in history that are now made history because those uh, activists are no longer with us, some of them.
We actually, we got a grant from the Mount Hood Cable Regulatory Commission to archive all of our shows. Um, there are 700 some odd shows um, prior to the time that we got the grant that were on old tape. And they're literally falling apart. The historical context is stuff that you're not going to see that nobody else picked up on. And the people who we've lost, uh, you know, Judy Barry, right. um, Michael Zinzen, who's a Black Panther from L.A., Carl Upchurch, um, the guy who uh, turned around his life when he was in prison, just all these people. And uh, we managed to get them on tape. Um, and they're In there. time. You know, I've actually forgotten what we called the one we just uh, archived. It's Peace Action Network about um, housing issues. It was called Money for Human Needs. Okay, so that was one that we spent a good amount of energy doing. It's completely relevant now as far as the issues and some of the things that um, speakers thought needed to be done. Some are getting done. Some still need to be done. Uh, it was, it's, it's very interesting how little has changed in some ways. Um, there will also have shows about uh, nuclear power, nuclear weapons from 1991. Same thing. <laughs> Why has society not changed since then? You know, I work in peace issues and uh, police accountability issues, and when it, when I, that tends to drive the work that I do. But one of the great pleasures of being part of a collective like this is that other people will tape other things, and they'll bring in somebody that you never thought you would ever go watch or go you know, go to their lecture, but when we're watching the shows for, to, for, to give each other feedback, you learn about issues that you weren't interested in. And that's what we're hoping we're doing for the whole community by putting this on cable access for the last 20 years that, you know, maybe you didn't think about this before. Maybe you didn't think about health care issues. Maybe you didn't think about um, what happens when uh, women uh, uh, walk for peace and to end violence against women in Peru. But one of our members went down to Peru and taped a whole Women's Day March about that, and now people in Portland can learn about it. A video bus is literally a piece of hardware where you press up different buttons to call up the different kind of video. So we have a, a you know, buses are show up in our opening credits, uh, but the the slogan that is in the opening credits says "All aboard," and the idea is it can be anything. You don't know what it's going to be from one week to the next. So some weeks, uh, the most easy things to edit are when we go and tape somebody talking and sometimes mm -hmm. they do a really good job and you don't even have to edit it and you just go from the beginning to end 25 and a half minutes of just that person talking and credits the end um, but sometimes we take a lot of different sources and edit them together it's something a little bit more more like a documentary and then every year we actually look back at our our shows and what have we done over this past year and all the producers get out in front of the camera and say i worked on this show this year and this is why i think it's important and uh, here's the clip and they set it up and we watch the clips. And as I see it, this is not to uh, toot our own horn about what we've done in the past years. This is to show people what has happened that um, they can learn from and use in the current years and what mistakes not to make because they've already been made. Uh, you can go beyond that. And uh, more importantly, uh, you can do this yourself. Welcome to the 20th bus anniversary. We'll be watching clips from the 14 of the shows from this year, including 24 episodes. Uh, as PC Perry, I was the field coordinator for 13 of those 14 shows. And Barb, you worked on, what, six? What oh, did you do? I edited six of the programs. Ah, tell us about year. them. Um, well, the uh, first couple of clips are uh, programs about the Black Panther Party. Right. Um, the first one is uh, from a, a, a presentation at the um, Oregon Historical Society. Oh, yes. And the clip that we're going to see is Percy Hampton, who was a Black Panther here in Portland, mm -hmm. talking about how skewed the media coverage was of the Black Panther Party. And it's pretty interesting. Now, that doesn't happen anymore. Yeah. <laughs> Wish. Several programs that we started. We had a sickle cell media program. We did a breakfast program where we had at Knife and, High, Knife and uh, White Inn at the Highland Community Church there. Uh, we had the Fred Hampton Clinic and we had the dental clinic. So we was recruiting people to help us do that. And thank you to the ladies in the back that helped out on the, the, the clinic back there. What we did was we had to go petition the uh, UVO board to allow us to, to do this and also the city of Portland which really didn't want us to have any of these clinics going. Um, the breakfast program, they tried to sabotage our breakfast program. Back during that time, they didn't have a breakfast program in the schools. 
So this was kind of like monumental that here at Black Panther Party was feeding kids at Ninth and Highland, and the police was just really, really upset with that. So what happened was that uh, Terry Shrunk, who was the mayor of Portland at that time, decided to counteract us with our breakfast program by starting a breakfast program in the city of Portland. And to this day, that's why there's a breakfast program going on at the, in the city of Portland, just to kind of counteract what we was doing as far as that goes. We had so much volunteerism going on in those clinics. You know, we, we, we asked doctors and nurses to come in and volunteer once, once a month. So we, you know, we was always wondering if there's going to be a problem with that, if we was going to be able to manage these clinics. After the second month, some of the some of the doctors and nurses would only have to come back every 60 to 90 days. There were so many people volunteering to come into these clinics to help these people out. Um, the press would not want to cover nothing that was positive with the Black Panther Party. If it was something that was negative that went on, they was right on it. So I can attest to that. I was around back then, and I know whenever I saw footage of the um, Black Panthers, mm -hmm. you know, on the news when I was a kid, um, there was never anything positive about the programs they were doing. So right. that was Although they've adopted them now. Right, <laughs> right. So now the second program um, we're going to see a clip from is David Hilliard, who is also a Black Panther, but he was out of Oakland. Correct. Right. And in this clip, he's talking about um, uh, comparing Franklin Roosevelt and Obama and the differences in the country today. So let's take a look at that. You know, there's this woman that I read uh, when, when Obama was elected. Her name is... Francis Fox Pivot, you know, somebody, yeah. She wrote something that I totally agree with. Agree with. She says that there's this parallel between Obama and FDR during the 30s, and that FDR didn't just do these wonderful things, that he did it because the masses of people, the workers, the unions, the activists, were at his door in the millions in the street and forced him to do the WPA programs and those very wonderful things uh, to help get through the depression. Her thing is, and I agree, that what Obama needs is a movement. Right. Yes. When Obama ran and got all of these non-voters and these millions of people who were who never voted before and young people, uh, it energized the American masses. Where are those people? What are they sitting around for? Obama is going to govern through his center, as he's doing. Uh, because it seems that those people that selected him had him lined up long before we got out there and voted for him. Because that's how the system works. But I think he'll answer to a million people saying that we're here demanding that you deliver on your your change program, that you bring community service programs. But other than that, I don't think much is going to happen because that's how politics work. You know, you got to have some kind of pressure uh, to demand accountability from politicians. Politicians have no accountability. They get these positions and act like they're, they're their own person to fight dogs. I guess um, people heard him. He mm -hmm. talked about movements, and now right. we have Occupy Wall Street, Occupy Portland, and they're, you know, the, the guys ahead of his time, and um, they're carrying on the work of the Black Panthers with feeding the people, providing health care. So it's uh, pretty promising because nobody's done that since the Black Panthers that I know of. The um, third program um, is uh, called Turning Point. It's, um, mm -hmm. you remember the no. What we were working on um, <laughs> about the restorative listening project on gentrification. Oh, yes. Yeah, so this was when they had kind of educated the, um, the white neighbors in the neighborhood about the, the awful effects of gentrification on the African-American neighborhood. Right. And um, the, the leaders of the groups talked about some of the effects on them. It was very emotional. Mm -hmm. It was a really good program. An environment has been created. Precedents have been set. Discussions have been had. People have formed opinions. Some stayed, some left. 
Whatever you do, we as all remain connected. Uh, we have to figure out how to love a little harder, a little more, a little more often, a little more um, unconditionally. Anger and blame are friends. Usually, where you find one, you'll find the other. They kind of hang out together. You guys, the world is crazy right now. We're assaulted every day. As soon as we get up, you flip on your radio, you turn on the television, and you're hearing all this stuff. Hatred. You know what's outside. Hatred, anger, blame, shame. All of those things are out there. And out there meaning in some of the institutions that we represent. So again, my question, if we don't do that, the alternative is what? That we become that? And I refuse to believe that it has the power to change us more than we have the internal and spiritual power to change it. I, I just, it, that's not an option for me. Hi, I'm Dan Handelman. I've been with Flying Focus since the beginning. And in addition to the four shows that I produced this year, I helped edit three shows by Mike Brown, who you'll be meeting in a little while. Uh, I produced two shows about education, both in conjunction with Portland Rethinking Schools. And the first one features Sonia Nito, who presented a talk for Northwest Teaching for Social Justice Conference in 2010. Uh, it was in Portland, and uh, her talk featured quotes from various teachers that she was interviewing for her most recent book. Her focus was on diversity and what it means to thrive in the classroom. She also explained, in her own words, the importance of multiculturalism in the classroom, and she gave encouragement to teachers to support their students. Our schools now are more segregated than they have been since before the Brown versus Board of Education decision, and it's not getting better. And now the most segregated students are Latino students, uh, segregated by race, ethnicity, and uh, social class. There's a widely touted achievement gap, which I always put in, um, in quotes because I think that we we shouldn't be calling it the achievement gap because that always places the onus on students and as if they alone are to blame for that achievement gap, as if you know they're just so lazy they're not achieving, instead of looking at all the other issues that I'll just mention briefly in a minute. Uh, and so I think we should call it instead the resource gap uh, because there tends to be, in most cases, a great resource gap between schools that are very well resourced and schools that are not, and also the caring gap. And that is that teachers, most of whom are white monolingual English speakers, often uh, have very little personal and professional experience with students who they're teaching. And so they find it hard to care for them in the same way that they might care for students who are more like them. You know, not their fault, but once, once we recognize that, then we have, to, we have to change it. And we have to provide those experiences. And we have to make it a joy for all teachers to teach students of diverse backgrounds. It doesn't mean to teach students to fill in the blanks, uh, to answer named questions, or even to pass tests. That's not what teaching is about. To thrive, according to these teachers, means to do their job with lots of sweat, dedication, love, and energy, even when all the energy has dissipated. To be advocates for social justice and advocates for their, their students, and to help students learn that they are lovable, worthy, and smart, and that they have both the right and the responsibility to change the world. So the other show about education that I produced featured Stan Karp, uh, the editor of Rethinking Schools magazine. He spoke in uh, Portland in December of 2010 about the dangers of the documentary Waiting for Superman. While you won't see or hear, the show is opened by the president of the Portland Teachers Union, uh, which emphasized that the privatization of schools goes hand in hand with busting unions and making educators' jobs and therefore students' experiences a lot less stable. Here, Carp explains that despite the flaws of the public school system, 
he is still a big supporter of it. Uh, and part of the event uh, included a roundtable with some of the teachers who attended, and you'll be hearing from one of those teachers uh, also. Now, I've spent a large part of my adult life complaining about public education, <laughs> criticizing the flawed institutions and policies of schools as an education activist, as a teacher, and as a policy advocate. But these days, I also find myself spending an awful lot of time defending that same system and the very idea of public education against those who say, sometimes quite literally, it should be blown up. Because the increasingly polarized education debate around education policy, the national polarized debate around education policy, is not just about whether teachers are going to feel the sting of public criticism or whether or not school budgets are going to experience another cut in a society that has a serious upside down problem with its priorities. It's really not even about the hot button issues like charter, uh, charter schools or merit pay. What's at stake ultimately is something much more basic. It's whether the right to a free public education for all children is going to survive as a democratic ideal in the society. And whether the schools and the districts needed to provide it are going to survive as public institutions democratically run by citizens, however imperfectly, or whether they're going to be privatized and commercialized by the same corporate interests which increasingly dominate all aspects of our society. I think we have to question whether education should serve, should serve our economy as opposed to our democracy. But even in terms of our economy, we have such a dynamic changing economy. We need kids to learn how to think critically, how to cooperate together, how to be creative. And none of that is measurable by these standardized tests. We're going to talk with Mike Brown now, and he's going to tell us how he volunteered with Flying Focus. I got the opportunity to volunteer through Flying Focus through my mom, through you. Um, it was a wonderful, it's a wonderful opportunity. I really cherish the, the opportunity to be able to work for this nonprofit organization. Uh, it's, it's a big uh, passion of mine in, in dealing with videos and editing and stuff like that. And it's a great experience. I really recommend it. Robert Whitaker was uh, a show that uh, you worked with Dan Handelman on and you produced it. Yeah, I produced it. It was actually my third show I produced. And it was a task because it, it was a long show, mm -hmm. so we had it into into two parts. What were they talking about? Roughly, what were they talking? They were about? talking about a you know rethinking psychiatry. Mm -hmm. It was about a book that Robert Whitaker had, had written, mm -hmm. and it was about how you know maybe we should rethink the way that we are treating mental health patients. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe we should not be relying so much on medicine, and instead try to maybe try different types of uh, care for them. We have three daughters, and each of them was prescribed antidepressants for what I believe was situational depression before they were teenagers. Um, the, then SSRIs, multiple versions of SSRIs were tried on them because they didn't seem to be working. And our oldest said to heck with this after two years and just wouldn't cooperate anymore. Mental health challenges or whatever are things that are to be managed and that you know you're not supposed to recover from. I mean, that's, I, I've heard that story countless times and you know, that, that causes a lot of distress in people. It's like, I'm going to have to live with this forever. It's something, it, it is, and then it becomes you. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's, you know, you, you're, you're continuously told these things and then you start to believe them. There's, there's no hope in that. I have a lot of memory problems. Um, which, you know, I, I'm not sure what it could be, but, you know, I'm, I'm coming to the thought that, you know, maybe all these medications while I was younger really, you know, messed with my mind a little bit, where, you know, I, I'm having trouble remembering and retaining things. You know, a math test, that is hard. But when you can't remember, you know, what, what it's, you know, what are the formulas and things, it makes it a lot harder. My road to recovery was when, once I decided, you know, medication wasn't for me. Um, it made me, you know, my personal feeling about it is kind of made me feel like a zombie. You know, I, I was, I had ADHD, man. I was, I was all over the place. I was happy about that. Um, and then it kind of made me a zombie, a little tired, took a lot of my energy away. If you go back 40 years ago, the prevalence of manic depressive illness in adult populations was around 1 in 3,000, 1 in 5,000, 1 in 7,000. It was a pretty rare disorder. Today we're at around 1 in 50. 60% 60 said they had their first diagnosis, their first manic episode after being put on an antidepressant for depression. So the answer is, can a drug, whether illicit or licit, stir mood instability in a way that leads to a bipolar diagnosis? And the answer is quite clear, yes. 
Thanks for watching part one of the 20th bus anniversary. Watch next week for part two in the same time slot and listen now for information on how you can get involved. Flying Focus is an all-volunteer organization uh, whose funding comes from individual donors and video orders. Um, thanks for watching and these are your featured issues. How can our listeners maybe even participate in the collective if they're intrigued by this interview? We have uh, a volunteer questionnaire that we try to uh, get to everybody before they start working with us. Video is not as uh, as easy as it looks when you watch TV. And even the ones I'm talking about, the shows I'm talking about where we just run a lecture, it, it takes hours and hours to produce a half hour of video. Um, so we figure if the person has the wherewithal to fill out the volunteer questionnaire, which is only two pages long, then they can probably uh, manage to make a uh, video. So we try to get people involved, uh, take them out in the field, uh, see what, what's going on. Um, there, of course, there's uh, other stuff like when we do mailings and stuff, we need help doing that kind of office volunteer work. But I, you know, probably somebody's joining a video group, they want to help us with video. Um, so they can call us at 503-239-7456 or uh, – Email us at ffvc at flyingfocus.org. And our website is www.flyingfocus.org, and you can find out more there. In fact, we have lending libraries around town where most of the tapes are on VHS because we haven't had time to upgrade them to DVDs yet. Did we give the uh, phone number of 503-321-5051? Uh, that's our voicemail where our show times will be. And uh, If you have any comments on shows that you see at the time, voice them. Send them in. We've been going on a shoestring and an all-volunteer group for 20 years. We hope to keep going. That's quite amazing. Great. Well, thank you so much for speaking with me. I've really enjoyed our interview. I've been speaking with Dan Handelman and PC Perry, two of the founding members of the Flying Focus Video Collective. It's been an absolute pleasure, gentlemen. <laughs> thank you much. And thank uh, you. don't forget that uh, bumper sticker, Don't Kill Your TV.